Well, good morning and welcome again to our online Bible study. Our theme through all these months that we've been going through this has been your kingdom come because that was the thrust of Jesus' ministry and also of John the Baptist. He was telling people to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And that's exactly what Jesus said at the beginning of his ministry. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. His parables were about the kingdom of God and what is the kingdom of God all about. So he was trying to teach us and prepare us to bring the kingdom of God into reality, into the world in which we live. And that's our mission. That's our goal. We are to be his disciples, his students, his learners. We are to learn from him and understand what he was all about. He was all about manifesting the kingdom of God here upon this earth to bring healing, to bring prosperity, to bring provision and so and deliverance of course from demonic possession or oppression and to set the captives free that was his mission and that should be ours as well well today our subtitle is imaginations and covenant two different subjects there but we're not going to be able to cover, a, you know, to get into a lot of depth on this, but we're just going to lay the framework and give the, uh, give the foundation on these concepts. So our scripture comes to us from Genesis chapter 8, verses 20 through 22. And it says, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, to Yahweh, and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Verse 21, And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, Yahweh said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man. For the intention, and the word there in the original language means the imagination of man's heart, the imagination, the intention, the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Verse 21, neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done, talking about the flood. While the earth remains seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Well, is this true? We have seen changes of seasons. We see changes between night and day. And he says that will never cease as long as the earth remains. Then God said to Noah and to his sons, he had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So God spoke to Noah and his three sons, and he says, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark, it is for every beast of the earth. So this covenant was not just with man, but it was also with every living creature on the face of the earth whether it was on land or sea or in the air. Verse 11, I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. 
and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. This is talking about worldwide, not just local flooding. That happens from time to time, but talking about a worldwide flood. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring down, bring clouds over the earth, and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. Of course, we know the Canaanites. So here we are. We see that Noah and his family had spent over a year riding in an ark. This was a large three-story boat. And why did they do that? To avoid the devastation of the universal floodwaters that covered the earth, which had come, by the way, because of the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. This is Genesis 6, 5, talking about the imagination of the thoughts of his heart. Well, if we, if we look at Genesis chapter 7, verses 22 and 23, it says, All who breathed the breath of life and all that was in the dry land died. And every living thing which was on the face of the earth was destroyed from man to cattle and to the creeping things and the fowls of the heaven. And they were destroyed from the earth and only Noah was left and those that were with him in the ark. So can you put yourself in Noah's shoes? Can you imagine what was going through his mind as he stepped off the ark in the mountains of Ararat after being on board that ark for over a year? And knowing that once the earth was teeming with life, it had people and animals and birds in the heavens and butterflies, you name it. But as he looked out, there was nothing. It was all gone as far as the life, as far as the creatures, as far as people. They were the only people on the face of the earth after the flood was all said and done. And the only life that now existed was what was coming off the ark with Noah. That's, you know, that's like going back and uh, doing... Uh, back in time, you know, going back in time to the time of Adam and Eve when they were the only two people on the face of the earth. Can you imagine what it was like for them? I mean, we're, we're used to having people all around us. But to think that you're, you're only a small group of people and animals and birds and butterflies and all the little creatures on, that creep on the 
face of the earth, that your what you had on the ark, that's all there is. And you're going to have to repopulate everything. And yet, knowing that, the first thing that Noah did really doesn't make sense to me. And maybe it doesn't make sense to you either. For it said in verse 20 that Noah built an altar to Yahweh. Okay, that's great to think that he would build an altar and he wanted to worship and glorify God. But it said, and he took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird that was on the ark and offered burnt offerings on the altar. So, in other words, he took some of the animals and birds that had been with him on the ark, the clean birds and animals. He took some of them. You know, he took them seven by seven. So, every species of animal and birds, etc., the clean went in by seven, but the unclean by twos. But here he took the clean, he took some of the clean animals and birds and he killed them and he offered them on an altar to the Lord as a burnt offering. The first day of their freedom, the first day when they get off the ark and they've survived a devastating flood, it meant death for them. Now, when you think about this, this sacrificial act came roughly a thousand years before the time of Moses. Roughly, this was 2500 B.C. or maybe, you know, somewhere in that neighborhood. Moses came along around 1500 B.C. So, roughly a thousand years before the time of Moses, when Moses went up on Mount Sinai and got the law and where he taught the people the Levitical sacrificial system. This was a thousand years before this was actually a quote-unquote commandment. The Lord had never commanded Noah to do this. So where did man get this idea of trying to appease or worship God by offering a sacrifice. Where did that idea come from? God never commanded it. He didn't command it with Adam and Eve. But you remember the sacrifices of Cain and Abel back in the beginning of Genesis? Nowhere did God command Adam and Eve to bring sacrifices, but Cain and Abel brought sacrifices. They were different types. Abel brought of the animals, but Cain brought of the field some of the some of the uh, fruit of what he had uh, been able to produce on the ground, and Abel had brought an animal. But where did they get that idea to start with? Because it was not a God idea. It was not recorded that they were supposed to do this. So where did this come from? Well, I think the following psalm that was written by Asaph deals with this idea. This is Psalm chapter 50, verses 7 through 15, and then we'll skip to verse 23. And Asaph wrote, Hear, my people, and I will speak, O Israel, and I will testify against you. I am God, your God. Now he's going to testify against them. What about? I will not reprove you for your sacrifices. Yea, your burnt offerings are continually before me. Hmm. Okay, so they're bringing this day after day after day after day, these burnt offerings. But listen to this, verse 9. I, talking about the Lord, I, the Lord, will take no bull out of your house, nor he goats out of your folds, for Every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains. Remember when Jesus said, 
that the Lord knows when a little sparrow falls to the ground? He says, I know all the birds of the mountain and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and the fullness of it. Will I eat the flesh of the mighty or drink the blood of goats? Again, this is God talking. Offer to God what? The bulls and goats? No, offer to God thanksgiving. What did the children of Israel have trouble doing? So, you know, they didn't have any trouble offering sacrifices. They had trouble with thanksgiving. They had trouble with that. They knew how to complain and gripe and grumble. But here the psalmist Asaph is saying, oh, and God is speaking, offer to God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. If you make God a promise, keep it. And call on me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. Now we're skipping to verse 23. The one who offers what? Bulls or goats? No, the one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice does what? Glorifies me. The one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. To one who orders his way rightly I will show the salvation of God. So what kind of sacrifice does God really want from us? Remember what the prophet Samuel told King Saul? When King Saul couldn't wait till Samuel got there and he was afraid that Samuel wasn't coming so Saul offered up a sacrifice Saul was a king. He was not a priest. He was not, it was not his place to do that. And when Samuel asked him, what are you doing? And he says, well, you, you didn't get here in time. And, and the men were scattering. And so I, I just put the offering on the altar and burned it up, you know. And here's what Samuel said to him. Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. You know, it's, it's no problem for us to offer up an animal on the altar. There's no skin off our teeth. But obedience, now we talked about thanksgiving, but here obedience, doing what the Lord says, is God wants that more than he wants sacrifice of a ram. Or think about what the writer of Hebrews in the New Testament said in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 15 and 16. Through him... Let us continually, not just occasionally, but this is all the time. You know, the psalmist said, I will bless the Lord at all times. Here the writer of Hebrews says, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. A sacrifice of praise. Okay, what is that? He says... That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. And do not neglect to do good and to share what you have. For such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So what this is saying, it's not the sacrifices of money or lambs or goats or, you know, giving up those material possessions. That's not what really pleases God. What pleases God is our praise and our thanks 
and also when we're doing good to other people when we share what we have with others those are the kinds of sacrifices that pleases God so out of this text for today we have two major concepts and the first one that we talked about was the imagination of man's heart going back to verse 21 and when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma the Lord said in his heart I will never again curse the ground because of man for the intention or the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done so here he's talking about the imagination I'll never again curse the ground because of man for the imagination of man's heart is evil even from a young child even from a youth the imaginations are evil and then the second concept is covenant. Covenant between the Lord and man. Verse 11, I establish my covenant with you, Noah, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. So let's look at imagination. What is it defined as? Well, one definition says the faculty or action of forming new ideas. You know, where do ideas come from? It comes from our imaginations, doesn't it? It comes from images or concepts of external objects not present to our senses. Talking about our touch, our sight, our hearing our taste, our smell, etc. It doesn't come from that. It's, it's a concept that we get. It's an idea. Images. Some people have dreams, for example. Another definition, the ability of the mind to be creative or resourceful. Well, that's good. Another is the act or power of forming a mental image of something not present to the senses or never before wholly perceived in reality. It's a creative ability. So creativity comes, from the, uh, comes out of the imagination. And also it's the ability to confront and deal with the problem. You come up with an idea or a thought or a concept of how to deal with a certain problem. And then it's the ability to form mental images of things that are not present to the senses or not considered to be real. It's the ability co to confront and deal with reality by using the creative power of the mind. It's resourcefulness. So, a lot of synonyms for imagination is creativity, vision, invention, ingenuity, enterprise, insight, inspiration, wit, originality, inventiveness, resourcefulness. So, just think, where would we be today without men and women who have used their imaginations? to create such things as automobiles, airplanes, printing press, the light bulbs, telephones, cell phones, computers, microwaves, air conditioners, refrigerators, and the list could go miles and miles and miles long of all the things that, like Edison, the things that he experimented with and things that he learned are like the Wright brothers who experimented and was tr looking at birds and how they were able to fly and how could man do something similar to that. Taking those concepts, the imaginations of your heart, the creativity, 
the resourcefulness. How do you solve these problems? That's all coming out of your imagination. But imagination can be used for evil as well, as indicated in our text. Because it says the intention or the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Even from a little kid. You know, there, there can be evil imaginations. Oh, let's do this. You know, and you get in trouble and you get spankings because you did something that you shouldn't have done. But it was part of your imagination. Oh, we just need to do this. This will be fun. Well... A good example, I guess, of what we're talking about here as far as evil imaginations is Epstein Island in the Virgin Islands. Not everybody is aware, have been made aware of what has been going on with Epstein Island in the Virgin Islands. But you know some of those islands are just so gorgeous. The water is so blue and pure. And it's just great. You know, it is a tourist attraction, really, you know, to be on some of these exotic islands. Well, when you've got a lot of money and clout, that would, you know, you could use it for good or you could use it for evil. But as is being exposed now, and Jeffrey Epstein was arrested not too long ago, because of this, because this island has been used by pedophiles and by prominent leaders throughout the world who are in government or business, etc., that have a lot of power, a lot of wealth, and they lure and entice underage girls, usually girls that are poor that are insecure, that don't have a lot going for them, and they lure these girls to this island. I don't know what they, how they entice them to do this, but in other words, to let them know, oh, you'll be with the, the rich and famous and et cetera, et cetera. But what they do to these underage girls is that they abuse them and misuse them with their lustful and sinful desires. They don't care about these girls. They lust. They have lust. And also they are involved in satanic rituals as well. These people are sick. You can use Imagination is neither good nor bad, but it's how you use it. You can use it to do a lot of good for mankind. People that can come up with cures for cancer or cures for certain diseases or come up with an invention that can make life a lot better for other people. That's what we need to use imagination for. But unfortunately, there are those that use it for the wrong reason. And that's what had happened during the time of Noah. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, it says, Keep your heart. This is where your imagination comes from. In our text, that's what it alludes to. Keep your heart. This is where, where imagination comes from. With all vigilance. Because it's from your heart, whether it comes out evil or good. For from it flows the springs of life. You know, Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Whether it's good or evil, it's all coming out of your heart. So we need to guard, or we need to keep, or we need to protect our hearts. That what comes out of it will be what it needs to be. And the Apostle Paul understood evil imaginations which is why he taught us how to do spiritual warfare against it if you read in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 3 through 5 
For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. This is talking about the evil imaginations. You've got to get those imaginations out of your mind as quickly as you can. You don't need to be thinking about those things. So you need to cast them down and you say, no, I'm not going to think that way. You've got to cast that down in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Anything that says, well, God doesn't exist. That would be evolution or whatever. And bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So that's imagination. Now, again, you can use it for good or you can use it for evil. Now, the second concept deals with covenant. And covenant in the Bible is defined as an agreement between God and his people, in which God makes certain promises to his people, and he usually requires certain conduct from his people. He enters into a covenant with them and then he makes certain requirement of them. And so in the Old Testament God made agreements or covenants with Noah just like we read in our text. He made a covenant that he would never bring a universal flood upon the face of the earth again. That there would always be seed time and harvest winter, summer, etc. He made a covenant with Abraham. He says, look at the sky. And can, if you can count the stars, your descendants will be as many as those stars in the heavens. He made a covenant with Moses. And he made a covenant with David that his descendants would sit on the throne of Israel forever. Now, a covenant is a binding, a binding covenant or an establishing of a relationship between two parties. And a good example of this is the marriage covenant. We're not talking about a marriage ceremony or a marriage contract. We're talking about a covenant that is binding, establishing a relationship between two parties. And that's exactly how God described his relationship with his people. He described it as a marriage relationship. That's what he wants. And that's why Jesus talked about, you know, the, talks about in the New Testament, the bride of Christ. That Jesus is the bridegroom and we, the church, the body of Christ, are his bride. That's the type of covenant that he has entered into with his people. And so the Lord spoke through Isaiah and said, This is like the days of Noah to me, as I swore that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so I have sworn that I will not be angry with you and will not rebuke you. For this mountain, the mountain may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you and my covenant of peace shall not be removed says the Lord who has compassion on you this is the covenant that God has established with his people it's a covenant of peace it's a covenant that speaks of steadfast love. In other words, it's a love that doesn't fluctuate. It is a love that is dependable. A love that is always there. It will never depart from us. It will never be removed. God has established a covenant of peace and love with us as his people. 
This is covenant. It's a binding relationship between two parties. It's establishment of a relationship. That's what God desires. The sacrifices and offerings on the altar, they're okay. You know, the aroma, it smells good when you uh, smell steaks on the, on the grill. I mean, it really smells good. But that's not what God desires. He wants our heart. He wants our lives. He wants to be divinely connected with us in a relationship that is eternal. Now, the relationships here on earth, they come and go. And even those that get married, they don't realize that, well, going into it, that they need to have a covenant relationship with that person. Not just go through a ceremony or not just sign a contract or something like that. You enter into a binding agreement with that person till death do us part in sickness and health, in riches and in poverty. Doesn't matter. God wants that relationship with us. This is unlike any of the other pagan religions where we're you know, where the worshiper is the slave and the God is the master. That's not the way it is with God, with Yahweh, with our relationship with Yeshua, with Jesus. It is a relationship of love, of steadfast love that will not depart from us and a covenant of peace the peace that passes all understanding. That's what he wants. So, two things that are brought out in this text. Imaginations and what they can bring about. The evil uh, imaginations can bring about death and destruction. But, you know, if you use your imagination for the good, you can be a great blessing to the world. And secondly, covenant, a binding agreement that you have with your Father, your Heavenly Father. Think about that. He is your Heavenly Father. We're His offspring. We came from Him. We lived inside of Him. We were little spirit beings living inside of the heart of God before we came to this earth. And it is an eternal relationship that he wants with his people. We have a choice, though. He doesn't want robots. He wants us to willingly to enter into a relationship with him. He, you know, just the story of the prodigal son is a great example of what we're talking about here. A father-son relationship. The father always loving, always looking for that prodigal, always reaching out, always embracing those who have rejected you and reestablishing reestablishing that relationship that you had before. This is a perfect picture of the covenant that God has with his people. He is he has that steadfast love. You can depend on it. It will not fluctuate. Well, I don't know if God will, you know, if he'll be happy or if he'll be pleased with me. He is pleased with you when you just say, thank you, Lord. I just appreciate the fact that you did that for me today. You answered my prayer. You are so good. You're so awesome. I love you and I appreciate you. Those words are what the Lord really desires. To have that sacrifice of praise, even when we're when he, even when it hurts. Yeah, Lord, like Paul and Silas in the prison cell, and they were singing hymns to God. 
That blessed God. They could have been in there grumbling and gropping and saying, look, I came over here to serve you and look where I ended up. And why did you do this to me? But no, they said, praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. So offer that sacrifice of praise. That's what pleases God. And keep and enter into, if you haven't already, enter into that covenant relationship with him. Because that's what he desires. He wants to say, I am yours and you are mine. And the banner that I have over you is love. Amen.